This week on Today in Space, we're going over the Polaris Dawn mission. Now that the crew is safely back home after recovering off the coast of Florida, we have Jared Isaacman, Scott Poteet, Sarah Gillis, and Anna Manon have returned home after breaking human spaceflight records and showing us what the first commercial spacewalk can do. We're going to go over everything here, and we're going to fly through it. So buckle up and get ready. We're going through Polaris Dawn's five-day journey and what it meant and why we think it's important for humanity and space. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Today in Space. Hello and welcome. I am, as always, your space science podcast host from the East Coast, Alex G. Orfanos. And this week, we're breaking down the launch of Polaris Dawn now that the crew has returned home. Now, the Polaris Dawn mission launched on September 10th, 2024 from Kennedy Space Center on pad 39A on board a Falcon 9 rocket and the Crew Dragon spacecraft. It was a significant leap forward for private space exploration, as only countries had been able to do this before. The Polaris Dawn crew reached an altitude of 870 miles or 1,400 kilometers in Crew Dragon, the highest any human has traveled in Earth's orbit since NASA's Apollo 17 mission in 1972. And that 1,400 kilometers also brought them into the Van Allen belts, which, again, we haven't had humans go through the Van Allen belts since Apollo 17 as well. The mission also featured the first ever commercial spacewalk conducted by Jared Isaacman and Sarah Gillis, marking a new chapter in private astronautics and for women traveling the farthest ever in space, which is a record held now by Sarah Gillis and Anna Manon, and soon to be broken by Christina Cook on the Artemis II mission when she becomes the first woman to orbit the moon. But let's dive back into Polaris Dawn. Some human spaceflight records were broken, the highest Earth orbit since the Apollo missions, surpassing the previous record from Gemini 11 in 1966. It's also the first private spacewalk by Jared Isaacman and Sarah Gillis. It lasted over two hours, and they tested SpaceX's new extravehicular activity or EVA suits designed for future missions, including those to Mars. The first commercial spacewalk stats are as follows. It lasted over two hours. Jared Isaacman and Sarah Gillis were the participants. Inside the spacecraft were... Anna Manon and Scott Kid Poteet. And one of the things that's really impressive is that all four suits were tested on this. All four of the people on the spacewalk, including Scott Poteet and Anna Manon, even though they were in their chairs as support for this mission, all four people were exposed to space and all four spacesuits had to reach the atmosphere. The entire team had to prepare basically from the minute they got to orbit doing a pre-breathe exercise to make sure their bodies were prepared for going at this pressure of exposing themselves to space while the suits themselves pressurize, which expand and it makes movement more difficult. This team trained that whole time. They spent almost the entire mission preparing for the EVA, and it went swimmingly. The spacewalk was successful, and it validated the use of these suits for future long-duration missions in space. And what's pretty amazing is, as well as being able to fundraise for St. Jude's Hospital and, and helping fight childhood cancer, uh, the mission also conducted nearly 40 science experiments in microgravity with a focus on human health and spaceflight safety. Some of the key areas of research included biometric data collection, where they were testing wearable devices that monitored the astronaut's heart rate, blood pressure, and respiration, 
telemedicine, where they're exploring remote medical assistance for long-duration space missions with real-time health data sent back to Earth, radiation exposure, again, the Van Allen belts. They were studying the effects of traveling through the Van Allen radiation belt on both human physiology and spacecraft systems, which provide important data for future deep space missions. And then the final group of experiments here, eye health and cognitive function, monitoring the impact of microgravity on astronaut eye health and cognitive performance during long missions. So that just like we've done on the space station where they've implemented a protocol in orbit for them to exercise and stay fit to counteract the bone loss and muscle loss that happens from zero G, they're looking to figure out the physics or the biology behind what is happening and implement a protocol to then allow astronauts to not feel these effects as much as possible when we start doing long-term missions and not just sending people out there without actually knowing what happens to the human body. And the re-entry for the spacecraft uh, was a beautiful sight. I'm sure it would have been incredible in person, but essentially the Polaris Dawn spacecraft, the Crew Dragon Resilience, re-entered Earth's atmosphere at about speeds of 17,500 miles per hour, 28,160 kilometers per hour, per hour, basically the speed of the space station, and it created intense friction that heated the capsule to temperatures of over 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1,927 degrees Celsius, where the heat shield is located. The crew, obviously, inside was okay. Splashdown was possible after deceleration from the parachutes and the spacecraft splashed down safely off the coast of Florida. The recovery process involved SpaceX's recovery team and recovery ships, and they were able to pick the capsule out very quickly. If you've ever seen it before, it's really impressive what this recovery team is doing, and they retrieved the capsule from the water. The crew then very quickly uh, was seen from the inside, and they were out jumping around, uh, waving at at friends and cameras, and it was exciting to see how excited they were after this five day mission. And they were immediately brought and done, and medical evaluations were done to assess their health after being exposed to space. The mission really was exciting. It was so much fun to be able to catch it. Luckily, some of the actual events were delayed, so the spacewalk, I was actually able to watch live while I was getting breakfast in my morning, right, but during <laughs> during the week, and it was really great. It bring me brought me back to those early days of the podcast where we were watching launches on our way, finishing up our college degree um, in between classes, and just being able to watch rocket launches on our phone. Like, that was... You know, it's a little more common now, especially on X but and YouTube, but uh, back then, 10 years ago, oh man, it, it, it was just as magical as back then watching this Polaris Dawn crew. So I had a great time. I'd love to hear if you watched it, what you thought about the mission. Please hit us up, Today in Space Pod on Instagram, Today in Space Pod on X or Twitter, and Today in Space Podcast on Facebook, and of course, or Today in Space on TikTok, and you can email us anytime at todayinspacepodcast at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. Let us know what you're interested in space, if you work in space, if you want to work in space. We'd love to hear from you. Make sure to look out for this Netflix documentary, or uh, documentary in general, I think it was on Netflix last time, of the Polaris Dawn crew they did the inspiration for team and from what i've heard it's the same documentary uh documentary team uh which makes sense because jared isaacman is still in charge you know running funding the polaris dawn missions very interested to see the behind the scenes of that especially now knowing that the crew has come home safe but that will be very important for spreading the word about this mission out to the public I know some people saw it, but I can definitely tell you there are so many people out there that are still looking to hear more about this mission that may have caught it on a headline or a tweet. One of the things that I think a lot of people were asking about this mission, which I think is reasonable, was whether or not this crew would be flying to save the Boeing astronauts on the space station. Now, the the big thing is the scale of this, you know, launching any mission to go launch and meet up with another mission uh, 
is really difficult. You, you need to plan exactly for that because space is about planning all of the fuel you need and just a little bit extra, um, some margin for when things don't go quite right. But there's a limit to how much fuel you can bring, bring up there. And, you know, this spacecraft was orbiting three times higher than the space station uh, at its at its highest. And, you know, it, it's just not planned for that. Plus, there weren't any extra seats for the two crew from Starliner, Sunny Williams and Butch Wilmore. Uh, so they would have been stuffed underneath in the cargo and that would not have been fun, uh, nor very safe. Uh, although a plan in case it was needed was... <laughs> was developed for the ISS. Um, not the best way to fly back. So that's why Crew 9 mission will have two open seats for Suni Williams and Butch Wilmore so that they'll be able to fly home safely. And one last thing I wanted to do before closing this out was talk about the why of this mission. You know, all the one of the big things about the spacewalk in particular that's important and we mentioned it earlier but the fact that all four people were exposed to space is really really important for the why and while there are many people who are alive during the gemini era 1966 this is the first time in my lifetime that any human being has gone this far away from earth and i think that can't be understated you know, there are many people who are advocating about space travel today, many people who work in the industry, uh, or who are just big fans. Like, most of us were not alive at that time. And while NASA may have done it, it says something else entirely that it hasn't been done six, since 1966. So, I think people get carried away with what was done first versus where we are today. And in NASA's case, in, in human spaceflight's case, you know, 1972, Apollo 17, that's also a very long time ago. Almost, was that over 50 years? You know, the great thing about Polaris Dawn and why it's happening in the Polaris program is to take these steps to push against these records and push the all of the technology that's involved, like the spacesuits, like the spacecraft, and uh, even the orbital planning. This mission was delayed many times because they needed to plan for the full five-day window. They needed to plan for when it launched and the various ways that they could have aborted the crew for a splashdown any time between those five days and then that fifth day needing splashdown weather for recovery to be safe. And they waited, and they were patient, and they did extremely well and that has to be applauded especially given the history of space flight you know this this mission was done with spacex and a private partner in jared isaacman right this this wasn't nasa's mission this this is a private mission and that's why it's a big thing because it is different it is groundbreaking that a company and an individual can pull together the resources to pull off a record-breaking human spaceflight mission. That cannot be understated. And knowing that I swim in NASA-filled channels, I can say that there's a lot of old-school folks who loved what NASA has done in the past that were kind of poo-pooing this whole mission. And it's clear to me that regardless of what they think, I believe this mission will be very inspirational for the people who will be alive pushing this and will be alive for whatever comes next for this. So um, while it may be frustrating, I do believe it needs to be spoken about more and not understated that this was an incredible mission and that it was pulled off successfully. And just the final note, because let's leave on a good note here. This is a big moment for any people launching humans and returning them to space. They have human lives in their hands. And for them to be able to completely decompress a spacecraft, expose it to space, have those astronauts' new space technology, spacesuit technology, work to have them come back, splash down safely, and be healthy and happy and excited 
is a huge, huge win. So we have to give SpaceX and the Polaris teams all of the props for major teamwork and a good showing of the confidence of what the SpaceX teams can do. They have been doing human spaceflight for a while now. They are NASA's ride to space, to the space station. Uh, the only human-rated spacecraft right now able to do so uh, on on an operational basis. And now that same spacecraft with some minor adjustments is doing it here for Polaris Dawn. And there will be more of those coming in the future, but we'll save that for another episode. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Today in Space. We appreciate you and we wish you the best of luck this week. Make sure to shoot for your dreams because you never know where you might land and it might be better than you ever th could have imagined. So keep shooting for the stars. Find inspiration in what these amazing human beings have done here. Jared Isaacman, Sarah Gillis, Anna Manon, and Scott Kid Potit, the Polaris Dawn crew that have returned safely to Earth. It was a good week, folks. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to subscribe. And we'll see you on the next episode of Today in Space. Mm -hmm.